Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Be Well Sis podcast. I am your host, Dr. Cassandra Dunbar. How has life been treating you? But more importantly, how have you been treating yourself? Me, I have been, I've been well. You know, the past couple of weeks, I have been off from school because we are uh, between semesters. I, as this episode goes live, I will have been back in the office, back into the swing of things, starting off the spring semester. I'm really excited. Um, I, because I'm just well rested, so I am doing well and I hope that you add some time to take some time off at the end of the year to just recalibrate, rest, um, engage with family and friends and mostly just rest because I know we are all tired. As I talk to people, I realized that I thought I was the only one who had a rough 2023. My goodness, the majority of us did, um, But you know what? I am claiming so much better for us in 2024. Like, it's just going to be blessings on blessings on blessings and good news after good news. And we will not be ran ragged like we were last year because my goodness, we can't have two in a row. (laughs) But today's episode, I am really excited to share with you. I have a Dr. Marielle Bouquet, who you will be hearing shortly after this short introduction. And she was the guest. And when I tell you the conversations I have are so incredibly timely for what I be personally going through. My goodness, the time of the conversation that I had with her, I had just had um, a rough patch with my mother. Hearing what she had to say and her insight on generational trauma and her insight on kind of parenting backwards and healings that we can heal our, our parents really gave me more compassion and gave me more insight as to how I'd like to move forward. And I told her that I really want to read this book with my mother. The book that I'm talking about is called Break the Cycle, which is a guide to healing intergenerational trauma. And when I tell you about intergenerational trauma, the I think what we talk about is what, what this refers to is what we constantly hear in um, on social media and things and, and in conversations about breaking curses. I think we didn't have the language. The curses that we're talking about are the intergenerational traumas, the things that we absorb. And then whether consciously or subconsciously, we pass them on to our children. They inform how we interact with the world around us, how we even speak to ourselves and and how we treat ourselves, right? Um, It is a beautiful conversation. We talked about so many things. Um, We talked about the biological effects and um, inherited trauma and how it truly impacts our DNA. We talked about the physical impacts of trauma. Um, We talked about how we normalize um, harmful behaviors because of the intergenerational trauma. Um, We talked about parenting and our inner child and parenting our parents and so much more. It is a beautiful conversation. Um, I'm just super grateful to be able to speak to so many just insightful, incredible women. And I'm happy that I get a chance to share it with you. So before we hop into the conversation, I would like to invite you to read Break the Cycle with me in community. On Patreon, we have our uh, book club. So the Be Well Says book club is on Patreon. And for the month of January, we are reading Break the Cycle, the guide to healing intergenerational trauma by Dr. Marielle Bouquet. And I think it is such a good book and especially good to read in communities that way as things are coming up and you are making revelations about yourself, about your family. You can have somebody to, to actually talk to about it. Who is outside the situation, <laughs> you know? Um, so I'm really, really excited. Again, um, we are on Patreon, patreon.com slash sis. The book club is $10 a month. The funds from the book club go directly into funding this podcast. The goal for the for this year is to have Be Well Sis, the podcast, stand firmly on her own two feet. She is a big girl, a growing girl, and she needs things and by things it's support and I can't do it alone. So I am I'm asking you to join me in reading a book a month. Again, the January book of the month is Break the Cycle. I'm very excited. And again, for $10 a month, your support 
will be supporting and funding the podcast. Um, So without further ado, let's go ahead and hop into the conversation. Thank you so, so much for joining. I am so, so glad you're here. Be well, sis. All right. So today I am super excited to be speaking with today's guest. We have Dr. Marielle Bouquet, who is a therapist and author of Break the Cycle. Thank you so much for joining. How are you today? Thank you so much for having me, Cassandra. I'm doing well. I am feeling, you know, settled and super excited to talk to you. So yeah, I'm I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course. Let's just go ahead and hop right into it. So this book is a guide to healing intergenerational trauma. So that can sound like um, like a lot to, to people. So what does intergenerational trauma even mean? What does that look like? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an important question for us to kick off with. So and, and I appreciate the disclaimer because it is a lot and it is in part the reason why this type of trauma continues to fester within our families, because it's so much that most people are like, I'm not touching that with a 10 foot pole. Um, But in reality, we're still living in it for decades and intergenerational trauma itself is the only type of trauma that's handed down our family line and through our communities even. And it is something that happens really at the intersection of two points of transmission, one of which is our biology, which is through our genetic encoding and the ways in which when we have a parent or two parents who themselves have experienced a set of situations that are profoundly stressful and traumatic, they can start embodying through their actual cells a representation of that stress and trauma. And at conception, when we're starting to form inside of the womb, we actually inherit these vulnerabilities to that stress and trauma. And it happens at a hormonal level, it happens at a cellular level, it happens at, you know, in when our nervous systems start developing and they start internalizing some of that unresolved pain from our parents, grandparents, ancestors, and so forth. And then we have everything that happens thereafter, which is categorized as our psychology. So the biology is all of the things I just mentioned. And then the psychology, which is the second part of intergenerational trauma, is everything that happens after you're born. So we're born with this emotional predisposition to stress and trauma. But we can experience enough emotional attunement, care, love, gentleness, orientation around our emotions and a host of other things that then make it so that we don't actually suffer trauma symptoms within our lifetime and we don't like express um, emotions that are incredibly incredibly overwhelming but mostly people that come from caregivers and families where trauma has run rampant and has gone unaddressed the usual inheritance is that they then start living in in homes where there's an enormous amount of chaos, there's emotion dysregulation, there is uh, fighting, there's a lot of nervous system uprooting that's happening in, in these homes. And usually the what happens is that the, these little bodies, these children then start absorbing the stress of their homes and they themselves start experiencing trauma symptoms. And that's when we can say, okay, now we have two generations that are embedded in trauma. Now we have intergenerational trauma. That uh, that is profound. And I want to circle back a little bit to the biological piece, because I think we talk a lot about like the physical, like the psychological impacts that like we can, we can see, right. But because we can't see what's happening internally, we don't talk enough about that. Um, Mm -hmm. So can we touch on that a little bit? So how can um, our traumas essentially lead to like actual physical disease, not just mental Mm -hmm. illness? Mm -hmm. Well, the thing about trauma and stress is that they actually produce an inflammatory response inside of our bodies. And usually the way that it starts off is that 
our nervous system is alerted to the fact that something feels off in our environment and we feel a sense of threat, there's a danger. Mm -hmm. And whenever that happens, we get this hormonal upsurge inside of our bodies that is usually represented through a host of different hormones like cortisol, adrenaline, and a number of others that then flood our bloodstream. And our entire body is in essence like preparing us to fight off this threat. And so what it's doing is that it's shutting off every non-essential function that we don't need in that moment in order to get through the moment. And our nervous system is structured to then go into what we call rest and digest, which is, okay, the threat is gone. I can now be at peace. And we go into what we call like, yeah, safety, balance, all the things when that doesn't happen enough and we are in a state of unrest for an extended amount of time and if we can think of especially us that uh the the individuals that belong to communities where we have experienced perpetual terror or if we come from families where the norm was for violence to be present physical psychological all kinds of violence um if we have been you know, raised in neighborhoods where we always had to watch our back. If we are raised in societies that dehumanize us, all of these things usually mean that we are in a perpetual state of threat. And if that's the case, then we never reach, or at least not enough, that rest and digest equilibrium balance state. When the body cannot reach a state of rest for an extended period of time, it becomes hyper inflamed. And that hyper inflammation has been mapped to metabolic diseases like diabetes. It has been mapped to um, inflammatory diseases like arthritis, like lupus, like um, even MS, some cancers. And so it, and especially any cardiac problems that are that have a very strong connection to stress. So we start seeing the ways that the body is saying, I'm tired. I have just been holding too much. Yeah. And eventually the, the body wears out and it represents chronic yeah. illness in a, in a organic form in our physical bodies because we have not been able to really achieve that rest. Yeah. Um... I'm happy that you mentioned like the diabetes and like the autoimmune conditions like the lupus and things, because oftentimes we talk about how those, you know, run in families as in like, you know, if your first degree relative has it, you're more likely to have it than somebody who doesn't. And now that you have said that it like actually clicked to me that not only are we in the same physical environment, usually with our first degree relatives, but also we're we have the same genetic, like we have the inherited genetic um, component Mm -hmm. of our traumas as well. Um, So both of those things like collide to, of course, of course it's going to run in families if we're dealing with Mm -hmm. the same stuff. So Mm -hmm. my question for you is now, now that we know what it is and how it can manifest, what would be the first step to somebody saying, okay, I do recognize that I'm experiencing these things. Um, what is the first step that you would suggest in order to take that path towards healing? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we, we have to take several steps, um, in the path, right. But intergenerational trauma is the experience that I like to, uh, categorize into four categories. It has been traditionally thought to be, you know, and and remains to be what we call a wounding of the soul. And the way that I conceptualize a wounding of the soul is that it it impacts us in mind, body, spirit, and culture. So it has this like four level uh, way in which it imprints into us, into our families, and into our communities. And so the the work to undo and unravel the trauma that has been formed has to address all of those levels. And to elaborate a little bit more on what I mean by that is that in our minds, we have emotions that we become stuck into. 
Like we become defaulted to shame, for example, and shame runs rampant through a family. And that becomes a, a very kind of like intergenerational shame transmission. We experience it in our bodies through a lot of the things that I mentioned, that state of unrest. Mm -hmm. We experience it in our spirit in that we become disconnected from ourselves, from other people, our relationships become fractured. We lose kind of like our, our place in the world and our connection to, you know, even our own spiritual selves and our connections to what ancestors desired for us. Yeah. We become disconnected, dissociative. Yeah. And so all of that tends to happen, but also when all of these things continue generation after generation, they become the norm and they become right. normalized and invisible. And we believe that it's just status quo and just things as they are. Usually like, you know, you'll have a family member that is like the perpetual, like habitual line stepper as, you know, um, <laughs> sometimes we say in culture, right? Mm -hmm. And when you, when you think about it and you take a step back, you know, it's a, we, in essence, normalize that behavior or normalize that person's trauma responses and say, oh, that's just how they are, you know, yeah. when instead we should be taking a step back and saying, actually, it can be different and it doesn't have to be that way. Or like something like, you know, um, which has been a norm in our families for generations where we've we've used physical punishment in order to rectify the behaviors of children mm -hmm. you know and it's just like been something that nobody has contested and not really realizing the the profound um inner child wounds that are created in children yeah. that go unresolved well into adulthood and that re-perpetuate into the next generation we pass that on as culture yeah. not realizing that it's actually incredibly harmful cultural values that we've internalized based on, you know, colonial uh, yeah. remnants of what we've suffered. And so all of this has to be at the mind, body, spirit and cultural level unearthed, dug into and released so that we can experience real healing mm -hmm. in this generation. I, I will say one thing that I always say is that I'm proud of this generation because I feel like a lot of us are are doing the uncomfortable sometimes messy work of trying to to start the healing process um and you mentioned the um essentially corporal punishment of our children right I have two little ones my the oldest is eight the little one is four and I'm gentle parenting and I always say the gentle parenting is not gentle for the parent because all mm. of the ways I didn't realize that all of what I thought would be like, like my first instinct as a parent is to do what was done to me. And that's not how I want to raise my children. So it takes mm. a lot of like relearning new ways of parenting and like learning myself and also like addressing my own inner child wounds too, as I'm parenting my kids. Cause I'm just like, hold on, these are actual fully formed little people. I come from the generation where uh, my parents are from the islands and it's like children should be seen and not heard. And, but that's not how we operate in this household. Um, so it, it's hard. Um, so my question for you is, as we are doing the, the complex work of um, healing from our intergenerational trauma and our wounds, right? And we're trying to no longer dissociate because I realized I spent a lot of my life, like I don't remember it because I was physically here, but mentally I was elsewhere. I don't even know where I was. Mm -hmm. um, so as we start to do this work, um, any insight or practices that we can use um, so I guess like not pacify ourselves, but yeah, in a way to like cradle ourselves um, as we deal with like the turbulence of like all of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, there's a concept uh, that I have within my book uh, uh, that uh, is in, there's an entire section to cycle breaking parenting, but within it, there's a concept that I call a parenting back, parenting forward. And it's in essence, the ways in which we reparent while we're also parenting the little ones in our lives. And it has to be this simultaneous process that is 
twice as hard, but can be twice as rewarding because we get to also see the ways that we're causing an impact that is reflective of the legacy that we wish to leave upon them and upon yeah. the world, right? So there's this beautiful transaction between parent and child, but there's also a lot of grief that's in that process because then we also have to contend with the fact that we didn't get the childhood that we're offering our own children. Yeah. Right. Ooh. And it's really hard. Yeah. It's hard and, and it's necessary, right? Because in those moments, we also have to give ourselves an opportunity to reparent ourselves and give ourselves the uh, gentleness that we didn't get while we were growing up. And what that looks like is I like to look at reparenting in a way that is both reactive and proactive. And what I mean by that is that usually with reparenting, the way that we've organized around it in general society has been, you know, asking ourselves, what do I need right now? And that's essential. We need to have a clear understanding of in that moment where we're like, we're feeling like we're on fire and we're about to yell and we're about to like really kind of like create this embodiment of the actual chaos that's familiar to us because that's what we grew up in. We have to just have a moment to really understand, okay, what is, what is happening? And there is a skill that I call still, which is a skill that helps us to regulate our nervous system in the moments when we are about to be reactive and potentially destructive and still is an acronym um, and it stands for uh, stop temperature inhale lay launch and stop is in essence like you just picture a stop sign and that allows you to really get into the imagery like okay i have to stop so that you don't then proceed to do the very thing that your emotions are driving you to do. Yeah. The temperature is in essence like a, a an actual physical way of cooling your emotions down. And we have seen that when we actually integrate cool um, and really, really cold like um, icy uh, practices into our body, um, that that can be very helpful. And what I mean by that is like, literally like splashing our face with super cold water, like icy water, or holding on to ice cubes, which is something that we do usually with kids, especially. Or actually, like a lot of people are, are right now, like taking cold water plunges or like dipping mm -hmm. themselves into like a cold water bath. And that actually releases endorphins that are really helpful in regulating our nervous system. So it actually has a neurological function, mm -hmm. but most of us don't even know that that skill is like, available to us. Yep. The next is inhale, which is taking deep breaths, but it has to happen for a period of five minutes or more. Most people take three breaths and then they're they're done. Right. And really our nervous system, especially old, ancient, intergenerational nervous systems, they need more than that in order to register that we're trying to help it to relax. So we need five minutes of deep breathing and really sitting in place and breathing in. And then the lay is like either sitting down or laying down somewhere else that's not in the place where you were originally having the conversation and really allowing yourself an opportunity to just feel the settledness of your body. And then launches, re-engage, go back into the conversation, then reintegrate into what you're hoping to do. But now it's coming from a place of a settled nervous system rather than one that is inflamed and reflective of the past. Mm, so good. I, I um as I have gone through my own healing journey and I've um been in therapy, one of the things that I really was really obvious to me was that I did not know like what was happening within my own self. I did not like know the phases of like my anger or my sadness. And I had to learn to like embody that so that I can teach my children to know their cues too. So I love this practice so much because I'm going to like immediately implement it with my children and myself. Um, mm -hmm. My oldest has ADHD and we've been trying to figure out how to help him navigate his big emotions. And I think this is perfect. And I like that you said that we only do the three breaths because I'm guilty of that. I'm just like, babe, take three breaths, take in and out and you, you might feel a little bit better, but you're right. We need like a prolonged time to sit 
to like really let our, our mind and bodies connect, like let's just calm down a little bit and then proceed. So this is beautiful, mm-hmm. um, super, super helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saying so. That's, you know, all of it is, at least what we've been talking about is the reactive ways in which we can then help ourselves to settle. But the proactive mechanism of this is waking up in the morning or just whenever we have a moment, you know, parents especially lead very uh, unpredictable lives at times, right? Mm -hmm. Where you just kind of don't know what each day is going to bring you. Mm -hmm. But wherever you may find it and wherever you may find it, even with your kids, an opportunity to dive into five minutes of deep breathing, do that, right? Like, but on a daily basis. Yeah. Usually what I try and help us to understand because typically people say wow five minutes like or every day and it it starts to sound overwhelming Mm -hmm. and like unattainable Mm -hmm. and in part society is to blame really we we haven't taught each other that the importance of being able to take that sacred pause and say um my humanity matters in this moment let me regulate let me embody a safer body and teach that to my children so that they don't have to be the adults that have to run away from their emotions in the ways that I did. Yeah. And so if we can teach children, especially, but even ourselves, because we, we are still always evolving. Our bodies are still always morphing where our brains are neuroplastic and they change and they shift with the behaviors and the practices and the thoughts that we engage in the most. And so we still have opportunities. You could be 80 years old and still have an opportunity to regenerate. And so if we can be willing to proactively dedicate those five minutes a day, it can make a world of difference. And I always like to frame it within how many minutes we have in a day because we have 1,440 minutes in a day. And if we take five of those minutes to regulate our nervous system, we can actually develop a healthier habit, a healthier mind, body, and spirit just by way of taking those five minutes. And, you know, our bodies are actually so miraculous that um, we have like, some scientists have been like mapping body memory and trying to get an understanding of how many times we need to engage in a repetition of a practice in order for it to be effective and almost a default for us mm-hmm. and there the numbers are somewhere around three to four hundred which means that if we do deep breathing five minutes a day for 365 days that's a year and that you know I, you know it, it sounds like a lot but for example i've been living in this body for 38 years mm-hmm. if i were to dedicate one of those years to re-engaging my nervous system so that for the next 38, I can live in a more eased body, that feels worth it to me. For sure. And it feels worth it to me to do with kids who then can have that nervous system default that feels rested and restored. Yes, for sure. And I'm so happy to have this conversation with you because this week has been challenging um, in, in my parenting life. Um, just, I'm trying to navigate ADHD with him and it's new to me. It's new to him. So I'm trying to figure out what practices will help. And this is such a good reminder that a, I need more than three breaths, like more than three breaths to help him. But also I, I come from a reactive place, you know, I I really do need to implement the proactive, um, deep breathing and mind body, like being still and helping him to under start to understand himself. Um, Mm -hmm. so I'm just so, so grateful. I, I I think a lot of the times I, I tell, or I think to myself that like this podcast is like healing for me, um, as much as it helps other people, I feel like I'm helped the most because I feel like the conversations that we have, like they're always just so timely to something that I'm experiencing at the, at the moment. So I appreciate mm-hmm. the, the reminder um, and just to reinforce like how I can help my child and help myself too. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I'm so glad that it could be helpful and tangible. That's what I hope for. I, you know, I've been doing, I guess you can say public education since 2015. And what I have found is that um, it, you know, we used to be in the, what I call like the what era of um, mental health where everybody was like, what is depression? What is anxiety? 
And now we are in the how era. How do I help myself? How do I help my children? How do we break cycles? How? Right. And so that's why I feel like, you know, the way I like to orient conversations is always to, okay, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. We're not okay as a society. We just went through a collective crisis. Little minds have been like really shaken up and fractured as a result. Big minds have been fractured as a result. What do we do? Yeah. How do we move forward in a way that humanizes us, but also like creates a legacy that can still be built on abundance despite how much we've been through? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I am um, so grateful for your book and for um, authors like you, because like you said, okay, now it's, we know what it is and yes, so now how how can I help myself? How can I help my family? How can we move forward with the information that I do, um, do have? So I really appreciate that this is a guide to help us with these um, different practices. And mm-hmm. I also um, want to touch on parenting back, parenting forward. Yes. Um, yeah. So um, can we touch on that a little bit more? So for example, I am in therapy. I have been in it for a while and I've been trying to reparent myself in order to be better for me, as well as more importantly, in my case, for my kids, right? So how can I parent back? My mother is not um, interested in, in any of that. Um, mm-hmm. In what ways can my healing um, facilitate some of her healing and her growth as well? Oh, wow. Um that's oh, so beautiful that you're even thinking about that because the way that I, I see intergenerational trauma is the intergenerational trauma healing is that we are healing those that we love just I want to say this isn't the only thing but also just by showing up as a more healed self mm. whether we see it or not our parents are ingesting also the energy that we're giving off when we're in greater healing Mm -hmm. and and that is already creating a ripple effect onto them in addition to that many of us you know we have these ways of and and i'm guilty of it of having you know sometimes even like perpetual fights with our parents about the ways that they're showing up in the world and the ways that they continue to hurt us, even if it's inadvertently so or unwanted hurt, but Mm -hmm. they still perpetuate harm. Mm -hmm. And when we can show up in a more regulated self nervous system, but you know, we are already in a position to no longer feed cycles that we've been feeding with our parents, because sometimes those fights, those interchanges are just reflective of pain. And they're, they're usually not very productive because yeah. everybody's walls are up. And so I, I just want to, you know, further assert the fact that by showing up as a more healed self, we are not only honoring them and honoring what they were able to give us, if anything at all, Mm-hmm. We're also not feeding the cycles that are going to continue to dehumanize us and them, mm-hmm. even if those same cycles were the ones that w- they taught us. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, you know, I always and I've done this for years in my therapy practice where I've been very much a proponent of gifting the gift of knowledge. Mm-hmm. It is very different to say to a parent, you hurt me and um, you're the reason why, you know, I have anxiety. Mm -hmm. Their walls are gonna go up. They're not likely going to listen. And you gotta think about why. When a person feels threatened, as we like touched in the beginning of this conversation, their nervous system gets kicked up and that creates psychological defenses where people start to defend themselves and say things that, you probably don't want to hear what you're going to feel very invalidating. Like, I don't remember that I yeah. gave you so much, you know, I put a roof over your head and all the things that yep. are, are, are going to be the ways that they're going to try and defend themselves, but it's going to feel very invalidating to you. So pointing fingers is likely going to backfire a hundred percent of the time. Yep. But instead what we can do is offer them cycle breaking tools. Hey mom, you know what? Um, I read this book. 
or I, I listened to this podcast or I learned about this practice, it goes like this, what do you think? And it's a way in which you can kind of like integrate the cycle breaking behavior into the conversation without them actually feeling like you're like preaching to them, you know, talking down to them, pointing fingers at them. And you can have a more productive conversation in that way because it actually helps them to feel involved and integrated rather than disintegrated and disconnected, which is something that I, I find that we're doing a lot with older generations. There's a lot of, which I, I believe in healthy boundary setting, but I believe that we're also perpetuating um, boundaries in a way that can lead to toxic aloneness and can actually isolate older generations and not allow them the opportunity to heal as well. Mm. It's not always possible. Some older generation folks really are so ingrained in their own beliefs and in their own behaviors that they're not willing, right, in, in any capacity to absolve themselves from those cycles. But it's not everyone. Yeah. And we become so incredibly um, kind of like emotionally tender mm -hmm. to their inabilities to to understand the world as we do. And this we, we have so much more mental health knowledge than they do. Yeah. And what we do is that we disengage from them. We disconnect them. They're lonely. We're lonely. And now we have a loneliness epidemic just like flourishing. Mm -hmm. And it's not bridging connection. It's not bridging conversation that can be healing and can create this multi-generational effect of healing across generations that really need it, right? Because yeah. they need it too. They weren't offered the tools. They didn't have Break True. the Cycle, the True. book, right? They didn't have this podcast. They didn't True. have it. And, and so in part, what we want is to be able to also pass on the tools in a way that they can hear it. Yeah. You know what? I, I, as you were talking, I just thought I am going to be vulnerable and I'm going to offer my mom the opportunity to read this book together. I think, <sighs> I think it, it would be like, you know, like I'm, I have like, I'm a nervous, I'm starting to sweat as I think about it. Cause it takes vulnerability for me to even like ask that and to suggest it. Um, but I think it might be really helpful, you know, like, like you said, offer the, the gift of knowledge, like maybe she can then take it in for herself and make whatever deductions from it. And that's that mm -hmm. it's instead of me just being like, well, this and that, cause I, I get it. And yeah, I, I have the, um, I'm guilty of like pointing the finger and mm -hmm. as I'm parenting my own kids, I realized that like, I'm sure she was doing her very best, you know, mm -hmm. and I need to give that grace. And if, when, because I'm sure they, they will say that I did this wrong as their mother, like I, I want to be able to like take it, but I know I will be hurt too. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'm definitely, this will be a, a good book for us to read together. To, That's so beautiful. To see, to see what happens from it. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really appreciate um, the, the fact that you are proactively engaging in what I call um, co-healing or collective healing. And I have a reference in the book about how and when people can do that with the people that they love or desire to see healing as well. Um, and there's even like one script about you know how to enter the conversation mm -hmm. into into a healing conversation and what to do if you don't necessarily get the response that you desire so that mm -hmm. you can also ensure that your your own heart is um, cared for and attended to and nurtured if the response is mm, I don't really want to right but right. <laughs> you but we can try now I will say from personal experience I have integrated my own parents who have a host of things and I'm very public about you know my parents um the some of the conundrums that they have presented some that have been um not necessarily their own fault like we have a lot of you know immigration trauma in my family um and and it's by way of immigration law in the u.s which is not something that was their fault right but then there right. are some things that you know are part of and we talk publicly about you know 
uh, toxic masculinity, for example, or my mother's like, you know, embodiment of guilt and how she wants to save her entire family. And like my sister and I, we grew up wanting to save the entire family and like being the matriarchs and like, you know, like just these yeah. like values that are can be so hurtful and so much emotional weight for a kid that then yes. grows up to be the adult that internalizes guilt and yeah. that internalizes ideas about how men should show up for them. Right. Oof. And so um all of that is like now we have open air dialogues my family and i that are multi-generational about these things but they they didn't feel good at the beginning it never yeah. does it's messy mm -hmm. it's messy it's and it's it's hard mm -hmm. uh you get left with emotional remnants that you have to then reconcile mm -hmm. you know but there's also a lot of beauty that happens in the process i say in the book that Right now, and even last night, you know, I was like not on my phone, taking in the moment, having dinner with my mom, my sister, and my nephew. And I'm looking at my mother, and she's, as I say in the book, laughing like her inner child never could. Aww. And it is the most beautiful. Oh, it's, it's, when I tell you, oh. I was recording her because I actually didn't want to, if and when my mother is no longer earth on earth yeah. right um what i want to be able to have that yeah. memory of the ways that she had this unhindered joy that wasn't marked by the generations of stress that she had to inherit and live in for six decades mm -hmm. and so it's in a moment where i get to see my mother in this pure childlike joy that is i never thought that i could and my mother um she's always been like such a uh, an embodiment of like the strong black woman, right? And I think that the strong black woman, even though it's a US concept, it is very applicable to a lot of black women across the diaspora. Yep. And, you know, she, um, you know, she was always like such a hearty person, really strict and all the, you know, like just, I didn't, I don't remember see, seeing her enjoy mm -hmm. for a majority of my life. So to be able to see that in her now is something that I treasure, I take in, I am mindful of the moment. I'm not on my phone unless I'm recording her. And it's like, how can I see my mother in her joy? And you know what that does? That actually helps me heal too. And it's not just that it helps me heal in a very emotional way. Also, in mostly when I do presentations, I, I usually talk about like neurons maybe a little bit more, but you know, we have this, this part of our neurological system that's called like mirror neurons. And we're like, in essence, experiencing other people's emotions. Mm. Typically, you know, I talk about mirror neurons in the fact that we maybe empathize with people in our lives so much that we tend to ingest their emotions yeah as our own hello yeah. codependency right yes. like hello like you know like diffuse family like emotions that are kind of like scattered everywhere and everybody's experiencing them all at the same time through this contagion effect and i like to very mindfully take in the moments when there's a contagion effect of laughter in my family mm -hmm. because we haven't had that for such a long time that now we're like really silly with each other we try and take in like, you know, each other's laughter. And, and so that's, that's a really important part of what I am trying to digest now, as I see my mother breaking the cycles, even though the messy part of it needed to take place yeah. um, for us to be able to get to this part that I'm so grateful I get to experience in my lifetime. Yeah, it's literally the fruits of your labor, you know? Um, oh, yeah. I, I like to think about um like just taking care of ourselves self-care mental health and wellness is like gardening gardening is not fun like the actual work like you break a sweat I, I started gardening a couple of years ago um but like then, you know, <laughs> then in a couple of weeks a couple of months like you actually see the labor of like your heart the fruits of your hard work and that's what you're describing I think that's so beautiful and I love that you mentioned like the joy aspect because you know, what is this all for? It's for us to feel whole and happy and, and really experience joy. Because some people go through their whole lives like just doing work and not experiencing joy, especially if you come from communities like ours. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know, um, especially when 
work has been, you know, imposed upon us in a very oppressive way. Yes. And, you know, we come from legacies, at least if anybody's like self identifies, you know, um, within the black diaspora in the Americas, right? Like, especially if we're, we're part of that history and lineage, there's a lot of ways in which for generations we've been forced into labor mm -hmm. and labor has been so perpetuated upon us in such an aggressive, violent, terrorizing way that it literally has left these like markers of pain mm -hmm. and that, that our families, you know, have, have, we haven't had enough of the moments in which we've been able to just like break free from all of that and just experience the fullness of what joy has to happen. That's why that, yeah. the, you know, black girl joy, black boy joy movements yes. were like some of my favorites um, mm -hmm. that we've experienced in recent culture. And then in addition to that, you know, like a lot of this cycle breaking movement that's emerging right now, because people are like, you know what, I deserve softness. Yes. Uh, my fa my mother deserves softness. Yes. No one has ever looked at my mother and said, you know what? She deserves a soft life. Mm. She deserves to have abundance and freedom from fear and terror and the experience of feeling unhindered joy. Yeah. Like why why not? Why not right. my mom? My mom yeah. is a, you know, very dark-skinned black woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that the world has looked at her and I've seen it, I've witnessed it, how the world has treated her a certain way because of the identities by which mm -hmm. she intersects. Mm -hmm. and, and it has really stripped her of so much joy for so many decades. So why can't my mother also embody yeah. joy in her lifetime? And so I'm very intentional about how I bring all of these lessons back into my family. Yeah. And, and I, we, we are a very holistic family. We embody a lot of these practices ourselves. We're very intentional about it. My nephew who's 16 is somebody who is incredibly emotionally intelligent, attuned and grounded. Yeah. And I think that it is a reflection of all, all the work that we've right. done. Oh, that's so beautiful. Um, on, on a side note, and I've talked a little bit about my personal life, but um, I've, we're in the thick of it right now. I, I feel like I'm in a, a very strange place or uncomfortable place trying to um, be better and heal for myself and for my children, but also I realized that, um, like I said before, I have been doing like that finger pointing and that's not helpful, you know? And right now our relationship is kind of rocky and I, I know I have part to, you know, I'm partially to blame. So long story short, this whole conversation has just been really, really um, enlightening and just allowing me to see the things that I can, the ways I can show up better um, to help us get to a place where we're all like really reaping the fruits of the labor. Right now we're in that muddy part and I know how I can, I now see how I can like tweak my approach um, in both relating to my mother and to my children for us to really have that full happiness that we're how mm -hmm. we could be a household full of like black boy joy and black girl joy and the soft life and all of the good things because mm -hmm. yeah you yeah. deserve it because you deserve that because it's been stripped from your family by way of society and there's an internalization of that that then yes self-perpetuates inside the family home yes you know there is this um concept that I have within the book um, that's called the intergenerational nervous system, which in short is basically the ways in which, you know, uh, one person's grief becomes another person's sadness becomes another person's anger and like mm. we eventually mm. everybody's in this contagion effect in the same home of having a hyperactive nervous system. Yes, so it's not necessarily something that we ought to be you know, uh, holding, you know, through the through the lens of shame, but more so through the lens of compassion, which is about a lot of what I'm hearing from you right now, where it's like, my goodness, I've been sitting here in, in this contagion effect and absorbing these emotions and this nervous system has been hyperactive because it's being responsive to the hyperactive nervous system of my mother. And, you know, and like, it's like mm -hmm. we start when we can start seeing 
that there is this through line and how we've been absorbing each other's emotions, we can start to also kind of cut the cord yeah. and say, you know, I can regulate my nervous system and show up in this more regulated state when I speak to my mother. And that way, the finger pointing won't be there, but there'll be an alternate way of communicating, which will then won't push her nervous system into a hyperactive state and she can respond to me from a place of connection rather than disconnection. It really starts to, I call it the upward spiral. It starts to spiral in, yeah. in you know, in the, the direction of health and communication and connection and love rather than in the direction of keeping cycles. Yeah. Oh. Thank you so much, Dr. Marielle. This was just a beautiful conversation. I'm very excited for this book. I will keep <laughs> you posted as to how our co-reading goes. I, I hope she <laughs> accepts the offer. <laughs> um, Me too. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, I will link where to purchase the book down in the show notes. Please go buy the book. And I'm also challenging you guys, maybe read it with somebody in your family, whether it's a parent, a sibling, a child. Um, I think this will be helpful for us to like start having healthy communication with each other. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so, so much. I'll also link where you can follow um, Dr. Maria Buque on social um, as well as her website so you can keep in touch. Is there anything else that you would like to add before we wrap up? <laughs> I'm so grateful for you. I would just like to say that, um, you know, I, I say this often, but I, I think it's worthwhile reiterating that every single day presents an opportunity for us to break the cycle. We just have to take it. And if we, you know, miss a day, just show yourself grace. It's yeah. okay. That's a part of the journey too. And there's a lot of lessons to be had in those moments. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your time, for your wisdom, for this beautiful work that you put out into the world. I'm super grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Grateful for you. <laughs>